In this week's episode with my guest Ian Stanley, we talk about how Ian almost became, or maybe secretly is, Batman. We talk about why most stand-up comics fail and how Ian's approach is radically different. We get into the three types of money, which is, I think, the most important concept that Ian teaches. Ian discusses how your self-identity impacts your net worth. We talk about why working more doesn't lead to more money. And we get into how drinking toilet water led to a relationship for Ian with a multi-billion dollar marketer. My name is Henry Bingman. This is Getting Out of the Machine. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I am here today with my friend Ian Stanley. Ian is an entrepreneur, a writer. He's a stand-up comedian. He's the author of the book, uh, Confessions of a Persuasion Hitman. Um, He's also known for his viral videos as Ly Topez and Very G. Uh, and he's very well known for drinking toilet water out of uh, public restrooms. So, Ian, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Wow, that was a good intro. You nailed that pretty well there. That's That definitely makes me seem mildly interesting. Uh, <laughs> mildly interesting. Well, I won't I, leave people, I won't leave people uh, leave, hanging on the toilet water thing because I actually think it's a good lesson in there. Um, but, you know, the podcast is called Getting Out of the Machine. So it's about finding, you know, personal freedom in your own life instead of waiting for somebody else to grant it to you. So I, you know, I was going through your book in preparation for this podcast. And one of the things you said in there that kind of struck me as interesting is you early on in your life, you said you're either going to work for the government by which you meant like special forces, badass stuff, or you're going to work for yourself. So that it seems like those are opposite things, right? The the government is highly organized, very strict structure where working for yourself is, as you know, anything goes. So can you kind of go back in that mind space and, and tell me like what attracted you about each of those options? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, they are complete and utter opposites for sure, you know, working for the government, working for yourself. But to me, it was the the things that I wanted to do with my life. Uh, if you do them not in the government, you go to jail. <laughs> so uh, that was probably the primary reason, you know, I got mugged when I was 15 and I just developed this sense of purpose that I wanted to be the type of person, first off, that that couldn't happen to, but second, that that feeling wouldn't happen to other people. And so to me, that manifested itself. And ultimately I wanted to go into either the FBI or the CIA, um, but I wanted to go into special forces first and then make the move over from there because that's how you get sort of the best jobs. I'd done accounting in college so that I could go into the FBI. It's one of the only like five practices they let in, but I was like, the last thing I want to do is financial crime. So uh, I didn't want to. So basically it was that the type of training I wanted, the type of person I wanted to become and the mission, I liked the Green Braves mission more so than like the SEALs, at least when I was younger, because it was about teaching and going in and giving them the tools to actually support themselves rather than just so sort of door kicking. What is the Green Braves mission? I don't know. Uh, it's basically, they do a lot of uh, they're typically the first people actually in. So like in, our, in Afghanistan, they were the first people in weeks ahead of everybody else. And they'll typically go in, they may have, <clears throat> they'll have direct action missions, but everybody has to <clears throat> learn a foreign language no matter what. And then they will do uh, a lot of training the foreign armies. So the idea is it's hearts and minds, basically. It's more than just, you know, we're going to kill people, uh, which is useful, but also, you know, we're going to go and we're going to train these these people and leave them with actual tools to succeed once we've left rather than just, Hey, you're liberated. Good luck. (laughs) You know? So, and it was really, to me, it was, you know, so much of it was about protecting the, the kid myself that had gotten mugged and wanting to be, go through the most hardcore training. I already got into Delta force, which you have to either be in the green berets or the seals basically before that. And so I had spoken with a guy who was a Delta Force commander and talked to him and um, he led literally the biggest operation in all of Afghanistan and uh, super badass and super humble. And uh, but yeah, it was basically like the stuff that I thought I was born to do only existed within the government. You know, if you go off and you just start killing bad guys on your own, you're a vigilante. But if you do it for the government, it's okay. So I don't know. Batman's never been arrested just for the record. I know. Well, dude, as this is so stupid, but I had literal plans written in journals when I was in college. This isn't like as a kid of how to become Batman, like which major should I pick? How am I <laughs> going to do this? Like, I really, I can say it now because it's probably unlikely or because I'm doing the thing where you're like, 
make fun of the things. Yeah, so perfect. To me, um, got to get that first billion dollars first, and then I can, you know, that, that Idaho Bat Cave is. Uh, I've seen your mansion now. It's uh, you <laughs> could fit a Bat Cave under there. You could, you you could. Maybe there's already one there. You know. Oh man. So today, these days, you split your time more or less between entrepreneurship, uh, the programs and stuff you're selling, and then comedy. So I'm I'm actually really curious about stand up comedy because I don't. You know, I guess Kevin Rogers has done it, but I don't know a lot of other entrepreneurs that have dabbled in comedies. And uh, I think it was Joe Rogan described it as the last true meritocracy. Like you can't inherit funny from your parents. You don't get laugh subsidies from the government. Yeah. So can you kind That's of talk true. about what the experience has been like and, and how you got into comedy and what you're doing with it right now? Yeah. Um, so splitting my time is probably not accurate. I, I wish I was you know, spending that equal amount of time. The funny thing is I have a program called the one hour workday. And even if you become the best comic in the world, you still work in like one hour a day, maybe two, you know, of actual being on the stage. There's obviously a ton that goes into it otherwise. Uh, but I think, you know, to me, first of all, there's just nothing I love more than stand up. Like there's no greater joy than being on stage and killing and just watching the just being you're so present there's nothing else that exists you can't be on stage and thinking about anything else other than that exact moment um so you and you're right i've never heard rogan say that and i've heard him say many things um you can't inherit funny it doesn't even matter honestly if the crowd likes you when you get there if they're like friends if you're not funny they can fake it for a little while but if you're doing an hour it's going to be tough to like fake Dude, laugh for an hour 15 minutes so we had uh i went to see david tell up, up here in pennsylvania and he brought a couple of new york city comedians and i live in the sticks man and uh the people up here are not really down with the uh covid regime we'll call it and yeah, so he was make, there was there was one of his openers was making all these covid jokes and it was just bombing it's just know your audience but you, you can't it's do so it. annoying. dude i'll tell you i fucking hate the covid jokes i'm so over it like, and this is what these comedians don't understand. Even like famous comics, like great comics have been doing this. They'll come out and they do 15 minutes of COVID material. First off, we're done. We don't want to talk about, you don't go to comedy to be reminded of the stupidity of this country, of what we've gone through over the last two years. I tried to watch Aziz Ansari's thing and all he's talking about is, and I don't, whatever, political correct, I don't know what you want me to say on here, but I'll just say either way, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, talking about it for 20 fucking minutes at a comedy show and basically shitting on people who aren't. It, first off, it, the, the other difference is it's got to be funny, right? Like Louis C.K. had a couple of COVID bits early on and he's like, he's like, old women just died faster. Like that's, that's what happened. And you're like, okay, that's actually, there's an actual good joke in there. The problem is people come out and they talk about it and it's not even funny inherently. And they think people want to talk about it. It's like, no, dude, people are here to laugh and forget about their problems. That's one of the biggest points of comedy is you're bringing light to darkness. You're taking dark things and making them funny. But COVID was enough for everybody that it's like, just shut the fuck up and don't do. And, and you don't need you don't need 10 minutes of it. Like, it's not necessary. I don't understand why they want to do it. Now, I had a, a producer approach me. So I do a lot of angel investing. And I had this producer approach me about, and he's won Tonys and Emmys and all the awards. And he wanted to do a show based on the lockdowns, uh, like soliloquies from people's apartments in Manhattan. I was like, there's no way the show is going to be successful. Like, there's, no. I'm not putting any money into this. I want to forget people about it. People want to forget. There's a reason why they didn't put masks on people in movies while they were filming movies when people were supposed to wear masks. It's because 10 years from now, you don't want to be like, Oh, look at these people all wearing masks. This is a horrible reminder of this stupid time. And so, yeah, I mean, but that's really what I, what I love so much about comedy and sort of for me as well as how it relates to entrepreneurship and, and stuff is it's, first off, there's nothing harder in the sense of just getting a person to laugh that's never seen you, never met you, never heard of you. And it's not, it's not difficult like being up there or anything, but you have to, you can't just rely on anything other than being funny. Like nobody's there. And especially me, like nobody's on my side. Like, and I don't know if this is a video podcast or not, but you know, I look like a lifeguard fucked a lumberjack or if, if, you know, Robert Pattinson and Jake Gyllenhaal did Brokeback Mountain, 
and got a little hairier. Like there's nothing funny about the way I look. I look like I would be the treasurer of a frat. Like there's nobody's on my side. Nobody says, Oh, look at this, you know, big in shape white guy. I hope he succeeds. <laughs> like people are like, I don't like this guy. He looks like he would have bullied me in high school, you know? And ironically I was fat in high school. So, was, you know, the other way, but, uh, or middle school, but the, you have to go up there and just be good. Like there's no way around not being really good. And so for me, it's just, there's, it's also like finding ways to comment on what's going on in the world in a way that's not necessarily, it's just more of an observation rather than let me tell you which side I'm on, which I pretty, I think I do a pretty good job of avoiding in public and private. I'm pretty vocal. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's one of those things, but now taking it really seriously now and obviously going on the tour and, uh, you know, going to film a special at the end of it. But one of the things I'll say, having been an entrepreneur and looking at comedy is you have maybe 10 to 15 truly famous comics in the world, right? At any given time, like truly famous ones. Maybe you've got 50 who are out there doing it well. There's some people on the road, whatever, but really you got like 10 to 15 people. That means that your chance of being a famous, like a top level, highest of the high comedian is less than being like an astronaut. And the interesting piece about that is that you have all these people at comedy clubs who are trying to succeed, who have never succeeded at anything. There's these guys who go up and they're just so sad and depressed and poor. And again, another reason to hate me for them, but they're like, they go up there and they just talk about how bad their life is. I'm like, bro, these people don't want to fucking hear about how bad your life is. Their life sucks too. Like they're not here to hear about your ramen eating. They're like, let me, let me laugh. But the interesting piece is these people haven't succeeded. They didn't succeed in school. They didn't succeed at a sport. So they're going and trying to succeed at one of the hardest things in the world without any background of success. And so when I started thinking about comedy from like the business perspective of what if this was a business? Well, I, I haven't failed at a business yet. So what would I do? How would I treat this if it were a business? And the thing is people treat it like it's art, which being on stage is art, but becoming a successful comedian's business. So it's this blend of, it's kind of like I explained with uh, copywriters. There are lots of great copywriters who make very little money and there are mediocre copywriters who make a lot of money because they understand the business of copy. They understand how to get clients, how to structure deals. And so you've got the same, there are comedians who will kill at open mics and nobody will ever know their name for the next 30 years because they don't understand that it's a business. Yeah, I feel like in business, there's a whole lot more wiggle room than in comedy. Uh, there's a lot of systems and stuff you can learn. There's a lot of people that aren't that talented at business that make good incomes. Uh, yeah, true. There, there aren't a lot of comedians that aren't that funny that, that well, go on Well, that's not tour. true. I, I would disagree <laughs> with that very heavily. There's, especially right. nowadays, a lot of it's not as funny, but I, but somebody, that's the thing is comedy is so subjective. I remember my dad said to me when I'd started doing comedy, he goes, well, if you're going to do comedy, aren't you, aren't you supposed to be funny? <laughs> and I go, no, George Lopez does it. <laughs> oh yeah. So, there's no. a, a lot of the, the woke stuff on, on Netflix is unwatchable. Dude, I literally tried watching, and I hate to even put this out there, but whatever, because I love Bill Burr, always thought he was great as, as a comedian, as an actor. I watched his, tried to watch his like Friends special thing. Oh yeah, that was, that was I unbearable. Mean, I, we, I fast forwarded almost the entire thing just to see what was going on. At the end, there's a guy singing a Katy Perry song, and I'm like, this can't be real. It was <laughs> truly, even his shit, he had... COVID material that wasn't funny. And then he had like two good jokes. And then everybody he brought on was even Attell and Jeff. Uh, uh, man, how can I be tip of the tongue in this name? But the the roast guy, basically, he, I, I couldn't, Jeff Ross. I, they weren't even funny. Like it was horrible. Like I was like, did everybody just come up with these bits right before they walked on stage? But even if I came up with, I can make people Laugh. I wasn't laughing at all. I'm like, this isn't, and the one chick just comes out and she's like, my vagina. And you're like, that's your opening bit. 
That's that's a premise, I guess. <laughs> that's not a premise. That's just a body part. Yeah, I saw Bill Burr live up here a year ago, uh, and he was he had to figure out the crowd, but he got it. Like you can tell a real professional because he yeah. gives up on the stuff that's not making people laugh. Uh, yeah, because there are certain crowds that are like, this stuff's not funny to me. Yeah, and he also to someone else, but not to me. He also figured out pretty fast to. Uh, so we have a big meth problem up in the mountains here. Uh, oh, okay. Lee Height in Pennsylvania is actually the meth capital of the world. Uh, nice. But so you, Bill Burr, uh, are you Heisenberging? Is that why you've got the shaved head? Yeah, you know, it's a uh, it's a nice little profit center. I'm, I'm, I've always been an entrepreneur. I'm willing to expand into new areas. No, but uh, Bill Burr figured out pretty quickly that his heroin jokes weren't working, and then when he switched to meth, it, it brought down the crowd. It's just funny to watch people work like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that is interesting. So uh, I kind of want to switch to the business stuff. Uh, I think one of the it's, it's not even business stuff. I, one of the most important concepts that I've heard you talk about is the three types of money, uh, mm -hmm. because I think people people have weird blocks around money. So can you kind of explain what the three types of money are and, and how you think yeah. about those? Yeah, absolutely. So the three types of money are the first one is maintenance money. And the second one is money now. And the third one is money later. And maintenance money is basically any activities you're participating in that are bringing in money that would be coming in anyways. So if, so the examples would be even just having a salary. If you don't do your job, you don't get that money, right? You're just maintaining the salary. If you are a copywriter and you've been paid to write a sales page, technically writing that sales, if you're just getting a flat rate, writing the sales page is actually maintenance money. You're just maintaining that that money comes in. If you have a $5,000 a month retainer writing emails for somebody, writing the emails themselves, people would say, I'd say, how do you get paid? They go, well, I write emails. And well, you're not actually getting paid when you're writing emails. You're just maintaining that. You're getting paid when you're landing the client. Right. And the easiest example is personal training. You ask a personal trainer how they make money. They say, I'm, when I'm training. I say, when are you making money? They go, when I'm training people. You go, no, no, no. You're just collecting money when you train people. You make money when you bring in new students. And when you do a group class where you can expand that and make more from less, you know, less time. So that's maintenance money. Money now is any new money that comes in in the next one to 30 days. And money later is any activities that bring in new money in the next 30 to 90 days or more. So sort of the way that I practice it and teach it is the ideal would be to spend 80% of your time in money later. So primarily working on tasks and activities that are going to create long-term income, long-term business growth. Um, this is the creative work of making a new product or creating, writing a sales page for your own company that's going to make money for you. Um, and then spending 15% of your time and money now and 5% of your time in maintenance money. That's an ideal. It's unachievable by most. I'm not there. Um, but you, the biggest thing is the best way to, sort of change your life with this is first off, figure out all the things you do that are maintenance money. So is it you're checking your email or you're doing, I mean, even things that you think aren't like that you think are really important. Look at those and think, can I outsource them or how can I stop trading my time for money in these situations? And then look at the money later things and find sort of the, the best way to implement this is the first hour of your day, no matter what, just focus on a money later task. So for some people, that's actually learning a skill, right? Like that you don't have a skill yet, go learn a skill. If you've already got a skill, then you're just procrastinating when you're learning that skill more. And you're like, I'm going to keep hand copying sales letters every day. And I'm like, you need to start writing, you know, like stop learning and stop writing. So just if you don't touch your phone, don't look at Instagram, don't look at TikTok or Facebook or email, do whatever you need to do and then get ready for do your work and spend that first hour on a real money later task. And I've had, I've had a student who went from 5k a month to 50,000 a month in income. Literally she was like, I just watched your speech and I started doing that. And now I'm making 10 times more. Yeah. It's uh there's a libertarian esque concept of time preference, which, which tracks this really closely. Like people with high time preference means <clears throat> they need everything right now. And people with low time preference have yeah. have a view out to the future. So, yeah, the, the lower your time preference, the more successful you'll be in the long run. Like, you know, I was able, 
I was able to stock up enough money and, you know, quit all my copyrighted clients to start this podcast and eventually a membership site with the, the, the view. That's all money later. That's all stuff that's down right. the road somewhere. So the more you You're can an audience. Yes, exactly. So one of the things, money is a weird topic for a lot of people. Like one of the reasons I hesitated uh, starting this is because I didn't want to talk about <clears throat> my money with a, a public audience. It, it, actually, it's a hang up because people are going to be like, I, I didn't want people to be judgment, judgmental of me. Uh, I didn't want to have to talk about this stuff publicly. But yeah, all right. I've made a million dollars a year. It's, I have a certain net worth. It it's, brings an audience in, uh, but it's uncomfortable to talk about. And then there's other money blocks like uh, Justin Goff talked about uh, how he, he got awkward when he started making more money than his dad did. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people have these weird things. So what are some of the, the money blocks that you've seen? Because you've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and copywriters. Yeah. What are some of the most common blocks around money that you've seen people deal with? So this is actually like my favorite thing to talk about in the business world at this point. So there's five core money blocks. The first one is rich people are assholes. The second one is money is bad. It used to be money is evil, but I've read that's a little too harsh for how most people think of it. They don't think money is evil. They're just like, money's bad. I don't want more money because it's bad. It'll make you corrupt. It'll make you this. It'll be rich people are dicks. And so those are two separate ones. So rich people are assholes. Money is bad. The third one is there isn't enough money, which is basically some level of scarcity, which everybody has on some level at certain points in their life. So even if you're super abundant, which I would say at this point, I'm it, what's interesting, we just had a really big talk about this in my mastermind in the Wolf Pack yesterday about people who be like, oh, it's easy for you to be abundant because you have money. Like, well, yeah, but it's not easy to be abundant when you don't. I'm like, yeah, that's the whole thing. Like I, I was saying, I had a girlfriend who, when I was younger, who would be like, it was when I was really into positivity, which I still am, I'm a very positive person, but like, you know, as you know, from the stuff with brands and some of the therapy stuff, being positive about everything is also a way to run away from stuff. But she would be like, she'd be in a bad mood. Something would happen at work. She'd go, okay, what, you know what? This is, I don't need your positivity stuff right now. And I'd be like, I think right now is exactly the time you need it. Cause it's easy to be positive when stuff is positive, but it's not easy to be positive when things are negative. So when it comes to abundance, it's the same thing where recently I had, you know, bought a new house. I had a cabin and I had a bunch of money tied up in the, so I didn't have a lot of cash. I mean, genuinely for, especially for how much I make, like didn't have a lot of cash. And in those points where you'd have this little pang of like, oh, I don't have enough money right now. And then in those moments, that's where I practice the most of like, oh no, money is everywhere. Money's all around me. Like there's way more than enough. And so in the hardest times is when you most need to practice. The times that you least want to believe there's a lot of money are the times when it's most important to believe there's a lot of money. And my belief, and I think the universe agrees because this is how it tends to adapt to people's beliefs, but your beliefs, whatever your reality is and your, your identity is, reality will match your identity. So if you identify as a rich person, even if you're not, your reality will shift to, and I'm not talking about identifying as a fucking cake gender or any of the stuff right now where, you know, identify as a cat. No, you just shut the fuck up. Just do the humans. I'm fine with any of the human genders. But when you start switching species, I'm out. I'm not, I'm not calling you if your pronouns are pussy and cat. I'll, I might call you pussy, but. I've always thought you identified as a wolf. I don't know. Am I, am I wrong I do, about that? That is true, but they won't acknowledge that in a court of law. You know, mm-hmm. so if I go around just chewing people up. Um, but anyway, so your identity creates your reality. And so when people identify as a poor person, even if they start to become wealthy, they'll move back to that poor sort of way of living. And the easiest example is just, with people's health, where if somebody identifies as a fat person, you'll see them lose weight and then they'll come back up. And it's because their identity doesn't match that new reality. Whereas if you identify as a fit person, the second you get chubby, like, oh, this isn't who I am. And then you go back to, you know, the mean of what you believe you are. So with money, it's so important that if you take, you know, sort of a poverty mindset or a, there isn't enough mindset uh, into your, your work and your reality, it's going to match that. Um, So there isn't enough is the third block. The fourth block is I have to work harder or longer hours to make more. And there's a big distinction there because actual hard work, people think I like hate hard work. I'm like, no, actually I like doing hard things. But the idea that more is more 
is not true even from a physics perspective like there's there's not always more you can do there's a limit in the human capacity of more but there's almost no limit to less there's almost always a way to subtract something from what you're doing and so looking at it just from a physics perspective and leverage you can reduce to expand but it's hard to always just do more and that's the answer most coaches and entrepreneurs out there are just like just I don't get it, man. Just sleep less and grind more. I don't understand your problem. And so um, that's the the fourth block. And that's a huge one in America, especially where hard work and long work is sort of the almighty. And the thing is, I wish hard work was the answer because that'd be really easy for people to be rich. If hard work was the way to become rich, we'd have a bunch of rich people. There's plenty of people that aren't lazy. There's right? a lot of people that work. 80 hours in a factory and are yeah, and then more or less broke. Money. Yeah. And so it's unfortunately not the answer because that would be so easy. It's just a, that would be a nice linear equation. If you work more, you make more, you work more, you make more, but that's not how it goes. Um, and then the fifth block is I don't deserve it or I'm not worthy. And that's a huge one for so many people. Most people have that on some underlying level. And it's sort of like that there isn't enough one. <coughs> You'll get to a certain point. And you'll be like, okay, I've been making a hundred grand a month. I want to make 200 grand a month. And this actually happened to me and I did. And then I reset back down. And it was like, that's where my threshold seems to be. And so working through that threshold, some people, the threshold's five grand a month. Some people, the threshold's 10 grand a month. And they'll be like, oh, I don't feel unworthy. And then they suddenly hit 25 grand a month. Like, oh, I'm feeling this unworthiness thing you talked about. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's just at different levels for different people. So those are the five core blocks. And actually pretty much everything falls into those five. I've done a lot of like individual work with people being, they'll be like, well, this isn't one of the blocks. I'm like, yes, it is. So like golf talking about his block of his dad, making more money than his dad. Well, where would that fall in? I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. Well, my dad never made this. Why would I, why should I be able to make this? And then you have a, like a big one for successful entrepreneurs is that their net worth is their self-worth. Right. Which actually falls into, again, I'm not worthy because it's saying that I'm not worthy of love unless I have this money. And so it's attaching their self-worth to their net worth. And so that's why so many successful people are very unhappy because they've gotten there out of their own traumas and they've worked their way to the top in order to make up for all their insecurities. And then it doesn't work. Yeah, I had uh, I had. I always, I didn't think I was <clears throat> that tied to my net worth being my self-worth. Um, and then, I don't know if you know this, the two fastest ways to lose money, invest in crypto or get divorced. And I, I did both. So. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know you got divorced. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. L- long story, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't have to cover that right now. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, it, it took a lot of work just on myself and, you know, working with Brent to be like, oh yeah, yeah. this, this is a big dip in my ego. And I got to, build it back up. So what kind of, what kind of work do you do with people to help them not identify with money or feel more worthy yeah. of it? That's a good question. You know, what's funny is yesterday <clears throat> they talked about it. Uh, we talked about that on the call of losing crypto because I had, you know, a, an amount of, I mean, I've lost, this is a funny thing is people think about it. It's like, I lost a million dollars. Like I lost theoret. I mean, I took some out at different times and put it in and stuff, but like theoretically you could look and go, I lost $1.5 million over the last four or five months. And like, oh my God, I, first off, I'm still up on what I initially put in. So I don't care. Of course, yeah, had I sold right then at the peak, oh man, yeah, that'd be great. It literally doesn't affect me. I don't care. What I did notice is there was a little while, and this, is, there was a, this guy asked me a really good question once when I was at an event and he came up and nobody had ever asked me this exact question. He's like, how did you work through your money blocks? Like, how did you go from, you know, feeling, cause I was very scarce. I was, I was really frugal, which is a way of for cheap people to not feel cheap. Uh, like my parents said, we're not cheap, we're frugal. I'm like, no, you're fucking cheap. And my parents have been here for the last week and a half. And it's so interesting, uh, different relationships to money, like their desire to not tip people 25% or 20% and mine to be like, I do it all the time, no matter what, typically give a bunch. Cause I also go to the same places all the time. And it's like, they're going to love you. And 
it's way more important. An extra ten dollars to them is a way bigger deal than ten dollars to me. Oh yeah, when so, I when I was broke and working as a server, like <clears throat> you really learn a lot <laughs> about different types of people. So now when I go out to restaurants, I tip 40, 50 percent typically. It's uh, it's the it's the way to do. It. Like one of the secrets to just making somebody super happy, or if you're going to go to a restaurant a lot, the first time you just tip them a hundred dollar bill not a hundred dollars on the tip. You just give them a hundred dollar bill and you leave, you don't watch them take it. And then, because also it shouldn't be about that. You're not there to do it for yourself, man. Those people are like, holy shit, this is my person now. And, uh, and so main, but again, maintaining that abundance, no matter what my parents have some level, but they're like, you can see my mom is all has lived her whole life and there isn't enough. She always, and they were around, you know, very wealthy people, like, I mean, literally like at the club, we play tennis, right? It's Wayne, it's literally Wayne Gretzky and it's Pete Sampras and it's, and then, the, and they're not the richest people, you know, cause there's the business guys there who are worth hundreds of millions. And the funny thing is my dad watching my mom and my dad operate within that world is so different because my mom is always like, well, we need more money. We need more money. And that was the overarching theme of, you know, no matter, it didn't matter how much she'd have, she'd always need more. And my dad walked into those rooms and my dad never made more than maybe 90 grand a year. And he walks into the same room with literally. Hey guys, Ian's uh, video froze for a second. So I figured this is a good time to tell you about a $599 gift that you can get for free right now. So along with A-list copywriter, Marcel Allison, I did a very in-depth breakdown of a promotion that I copied Chief Marcelo on. Now, even if you're not a copywriter, you're going to get a lot out of this because we're going to show you the practical application of five of my biggest secrets of selling. So the first secret is how to iterate your way to a big idea. That's how to develop a big idea that weaves a golden thread through the whole promo. Second secret is about misdirection. That's how you plant the seeds that keep people engaged to the whole video uh, without using shady tactics. The third secret is called Guru Superpowers. This is how to merge the big idea with the guru's godlike power to create an unstoppable force in the audience's mind. The fourth secret is entertainment. This is how you breathe life into your copy so it doesn't sound like some ultra dry recitation of facts and figures. The fifth secret is called transmutation. This is a big one. It's how to take an ordinary product and turn it into an experience or a movement that people can get behind. Now, Marcella was recently selling this 10 video course for $599, but now I have the rights to it and I'm giving it away for free. So I highly recommend you check it out. Just go to henryb.co slash Ian. That's henryb.co slash Ian. All right, Ian's video is working again. So let's jump back into this conversation. I think I got you back. Okay, where did it cut out? Uh, that your parents were around Wayne Gretzky. I think that's where. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so, so watching them operate around these really wealthy people was interesting because they had a very different approach, basically. Like my mom is always in the place of we need more money. No matter how much she had, she would always want more money. And my dad, who he never made more than maybe 90 grand a year, he would walk into the same room with, you know, it's Wayne Gretzky. And then it's literally these people who have like hundred million dollar companies and, or people even just making millions a year at their job, whatever it is. And there's my dad making 90 grand. And he never, ever felt less than any of those people. And partially because his ego is more wrapped up in tennis and he's the best tennis player, but he didn't care. He never was like, I mean, because there have been a lot of famous people that never treated anybody different, treated every person the same, whether they were fucking broke or a waiter or they were literally Wayne Gretzky, didn't care, which is a really great lesson to learn when you're younger is just to everybody's people. Like that's also the funniest thing about celebrities is the biggest thing they want is for you to treat them like a normal person and not freak the fuck out and it be weird. I think it depends. So I was just uh, last weekend, I was in Kansas City at this big charity event I go to every year with uh, Jed Canty is one of the big sponsors. So it's Paul Rudd, uh, Jason Sudeikis, although he was off in London filming Ted Lasso this week. Um, David Koechner, um, Cheryl Crow was there. And then a bunch of people from like Saturday Night Live and Grey's Anatomy. And the, the lower the status of the celebrity, the more they want them you to recognize them. Oh, yeah. I had this uh, like... 100%. I had this awkward encounter with, uh, it was 1 a.m. I just gotten back from the event. I was riding up the uh, the elevator to my hotel room. And this guy's like, hey, uh, so what what did you get to? And I was, I was a big slick. He's like, oh, cool. You want to take a picture? I'm like, wait, am I supposed to know who you are? And it turns out he was. Yeah. 
they all they yes it was awkward um but it turns out he's his name is dustin colquette <clears throat> he was the backup punter for the kansas city chiefs when they won the super bowl so he pulls out this big ass ring and uh i put on a super bowl ring and take a photo with him so it was actually kind of cool but it's just that, the, that's pretty desperate yeah but it's weird that a lot of these celebrities that you, you'll just be talking to a normal person and they'll lean over and say like so do you want to take a picture and i'm like well, sure <laughs> i don't know that's so bizarre to me <clears throat> So like, you know how it is in like the copywriting world where I'm, I'm not a celebrity by any means in any sort of way, but at those events, at this point, most of the people do know who I am from stuff. And I literally treat every person the same. And there'll be people who are like, they're like, oh, hi, my name's Joe or whatever. And I'm like, hey, I'm Ian. And they're like, I know who you are. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to assume that you do. Like, I'm going to pretend like, I'm just a normal motherfucker because guess what? Not at this hotel full of all these people. I'm just a normal person. Yeah, in but, the real world, nobody knows who we are. Yeah, if I leave, <laughs> if I leave this lobby, I am invisible. You know, so it's it, it is interesting. But so even so, going back to the money stuff, um, this guy asked me, "He's like, how did you work through your blocks?" And the biggest thing is the the best way to work through your money blocks is to notice things as they arise. Notice when you have, like some people have, they get the shoulder raise feeling of like scarcity or they get a gut feeling or it's their chest and noticing these feelings and these thoughts and then releasing them in the moment of like, no, 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 there is enough money. Like not even no, 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 not saying, not trying to push it away. You're accepting that you have that feeling and then working through it in that moment and releasing the tension from what that is. But the best way, in my opinion, to change these blocks at a root level, and you know, having worked with Brent, who was the therapist guy that I had a business with that Henry and I both worked with, um, you have to go to the root of your issues. You can't just, this is why like an affirmation doesn't work of I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. First off, affirmations only work in two situations. The first is if you're in a suggestive state, so doing some meditation and deep breathing before. The second is looking in the mirror because it mimics the mother to child relationship. So standing in the mirror, looking yourself in the eyes and saying it. Um, but affirmations on their own, you've got to go down to the root of the actual issue. So I have these meditations, I have this whole money blocks course, but basically these meditations for each block specifically so that you can retrain your subconscious and unconscious mind to remove the block rather than just pushing it down, which is what so many people do. Or they literally deal with the block of there isn't enough money by just trying to make more money. And then the irony is they get there. My business partner, I told about this, the more money he had, the, he didn't feel less scarce. He actually felt more scarce because first off, he's still, he was at a million a year comparing himself to the guys at five. And then, you know, looking at his bank account and going, well, now that's a lot to lose. You know, as opposed to being like, I'm chill. It's like, it didn't matter how much there was. Yeah, I feel like people get stuck on a treadmill of uh, comparing themselves to other people too much. And there's always going to be somebody that's ahead of you in some area that you care about. Like, even if you're Elon Musk or the richest person in the world, you're going to look at somebody else and like, oh, they're fitter than me. They're better looking. There's there's always a treadmill that you can get on. Uh, So you can always be worse than other people. You you are worse than other people in some areas. You just have to you have to learn to accept it. It's okay. You can't be the best at everything. hundred uh, percent. And there's a lot can't. of, I can't know. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can. All right. I know we have a hard out in, in like 10, 15 minutes. So I don't want to leave people hanging on the toilet water thing. So oh, can, yes. can you tell people the, uh, the story of, of how you came to drink toilet water in, I think it was LAX is the video I saw. Yeah. The first one was actually in a public bathroom at our office in Austin. So, when we say this, all of you guys sitting there, this guy drinks toilet water. You might have left the podcast right away thinking, who is this weirdo? Um, and in that case, you're not here and, and fuck you. Um, I can say that because that's the people who aren't listening. Uh, but basically, I, I did it with a water filter. So it's very important to add that piece. So I was working with a company that we started selling these water filters that were incredible. And so the first one I did actually we did it in one take and I was like, Hey, I'm in and I'm about to drink toilet water. It was basically the jackass open. 
So same thing as, you know, I'm Johnny Knoxville and I'm about to, you know, ride a bull. But instead I was drinking toilet water. And then I went in and we had this big guy from a office who walked out of the stall right as I went to go into it. I was like, I know there's an open stall, but I'm going to use this one that he was just in. And so uh, the most important lesson there, actually, first off, obviously there's a shock factor that's going to get people's attention. The second is uh, the fact that <coughs> it's really good proof that the filter really works. And the third thing is one of the best marketing lessons I could ever teach somebody is the difference between what I call deniable proof and undeniable proof. So even if you write a test, if you have somebody who wrote in a testimonial and you just rewrite their testimonial on your page, that's deniable. Whereas if you take a screenshot of a Facebook comment that they made, even if you could Photoshop that, 99% of people are like, that's real proof. So to me, I knew that if at any point during that video, any point at all, I cut or wasn't in the shot, that people wouldn't believe that I drank the water. So I view it like, I view undeniable proof like a magician doing a trick. How can you cover every objection so that they don't think it's a trick and they think it's really magic, right? Obviously people know it's not, but where you're like, hmm, that guy really did just eat glass. And there's a great uh, thing of David Blaine with Ricky Gervais is, and uh, it's when, you know, he's doing magic for all these celebrities and sometimes they're tricks. And there's a point where, David Blaine's sitting there with Ricky Gervais and he starts putting a metal rod through his arm and David Blaine goes, he's like, look, doesn't that look real? Doesn't that look real? And Ricky's going, he goes, David, that's not a trick. He said, that's, you're just putting a fucking needle through your arm. Is that's not, how is that magic? He goes, that's just a rod. And, and, the, and there's a point where you go, that's not a trick. Literally David Blaine can just put metal through his skin. And so that's what I wanted people to believe is there's no way this is a trick. There's no way this is fake. So there's no cut on the camera because if you cut even literally once for one second, or if I leave the frame for a second, something could have been faked. So I scoop the water out of the toilet, go in, put it in the filter, let it filter while I talk about it, pour it into a glass, drink it, swallow it, make sure they know that I really did. Um, and so that one went to, that got like 500,000 views in like two days on YouTube back that first one. And then the company that we were selling them, like who was our manufacturer, was like, oh, we can't do that. And I'm like, that's stupid. And they cost themselves probably like $5 million at least. Um, and then I did it again in LAX. And I literally had to wait out. Of, if I don't know if you remember that. I had to wait. And again, we couldn't cut. So I had to stand in front of this toilet. And we're just on high speed waiting for a dude to just finish shitting. And you know that airport bathrooms are the worst place because there's no, there's, there's three reasons. One, no responsibility, no accountability. These dudes are in there and they don't know anybody else in the bathroom and they don't care. So they're like, I'm going to make all the weirdest noises you've never wanted to hear. And then the second thing is they've just been on a plane for hours and a lot of people apparently save up. And then the third thing is they've just been in a place eating foods they don't normally eat. And so a men's airport bathroom I, is truly one of the worst places in the world. And the sound, it echoes. It's always such a high ceiling. It's just a horrible place. You can cut this part if you want. <laughs> no, no, we're keeping this all right. <laughs> but, uh, but so those videos, you know, they did really well. And that's how a lot of people, they actually, it led to one of the most interesting things is it led to some of the, my best relationships with, uh, marketers because marketers love, you know, ingenuity. And so Ron Lynch, uh, who I didn't know at the time, he sold like $4 billion worth of products through information stuff. He did OxyClean and GoPro. He's the one who made the, them turn the GoPro around. Um, and he's done Samsung's new vacuum. All sorts of crazy. The, the Foreman girl, uh, he saw the video and then, asked a person who he thought might know me if he could talk to me. And there I was, I was 25 years old. I remember exactly where I was standing in this office. And I'm talking to this guy who sold $4 billion worth of products. And I felt unworthy. And I'm like, why is he talking to me? Like, I'm just some young idiot who drank out of a toilet. Why does he, and he's telling me these incredible stories. And then he ended up becoming almost like my second father in Austin when I lived there and a huge mentor to me. And so it actually led to, 
And then like, you know, the first time when I was hanging out with Russell Brunson, he's like the first, you know, he'll go, oh, toilet water guy, you know, <laughs> and now it's the muscle Funson guy because I have a parody of him. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, people haven't forgotten that. So let's talk about some of those, uh, parody videos. You, you, so it, it actually is related to the same toilet water thing. You do a lot of things that get, so I, I've actually, I see you in kind of two modes, especially writing or videos. You're either, you know, being funny or satirical or something. And it's pretty amusing, or you're being like guts on the floor open about your entire life. So how do you think about when you're making these videos? Like, do you have a strategy behind it or is it whatever feels right in the moment? Um, I figured out who you sound like. I, I've been trying to figure out which interviewer you remind me of this whole time. And it's uh, Sean, um, God, what's his last name from uh, um, Hot Wings or not Hot Wings, Hot Ones. Oh, so not even famous enough to remember, but good. Okay. No, no, no. His last name, do you not know? He's literally like widely regarded as like maybe the best interviewer in the world right now. Oh, really? I just actually Incredible. saw he was he was in Kansas City at that event. They did a live hot ones with uh, Paul Rudd and Eric Stone Street. Oh, really? Yeah. Dude, Paul Rudd, that guy is not aging. No, I know. It's I, depressing. I have. So have I've taken seen, a picture. Have you seen Living With Yourself, that show on Netflix with him? No, I haven't. It's basically about how he gets a clone. And I'm like, this isn't a fictional show. This is a documentary about <laughs> how Paul Rudd has not changed his age in 30 years. It's weird because uh, I've, I've been doing this event in Kansas City since 2014. And every year I look older and he looks exactly the same. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's very funny. It's creepy. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to the parody characters... I think we're talking about, I can't remember what I was saying there, but basically um, I, you know, I started doing them because they're fun. Just a good time. I had this idea for this character called Lie Topaz. And uh, I literally, people like, you're so creative. I'm like, all I did was switch the letters around from Ty Lopez to Lie Topaz. And it was when the here in my garage ad was everywhere. Yeah. And so I posted, I made this one at this chateau and uh, in France that we were staying at and, I waited. I was afraid to make it. And so I waited till the very last day, the very last minute, people were literally getting into the buses. And I had this idea for this joke was basically, I have to have an idea. I'll tell you, this is the most important part of the Lie Topaz, Very G. Ken Cardone is probably actually the funniest inherently. Like if you, if you don't even know the characters, there's Muscle Funson and Silly Jean. And uh, the, there has to be a good premise within it. That's not just, the joke of the parody because so it has to be inherently funny independent of just the joke about the guy so the first one was that there was this ridiculous library in the chateau so i said here's my library this is where i go to lie about all the books i read that's why i call it a library and so that was the first concept and then with you know very g it was like dream while you're awake it was like everybody's dreaming because they're sleeping too much you know you got to dream while you're awake and and then, uh, you know, Ken Cardone is just outrageous because he's, I, if you actually, I watched one of his interviews for like the first time the other day. I was like, I never, I thought my impression was good, but not like unbelievable of how he is. I'm like, oh no, I'm better than I thought on this one. I'll give myself, because he doesn't answer any questions. People ask him a question. He, does, he goes, look, let me tell you this. If a walrus and a dolphin both played tennis together, I could sell them both a tennis ball. And you're like, what do you mean, Grant? That's not a, nobody talked about Warriors as a Dolphins. How did you get there? I was asking you how to buy a house. Um, but so really it just became, it's the same thing I do most often, which is just to be opposite of what's going on. You just take what's happening and you do the opposite. So with Ryan Stuman, I did a parody called Crying Stuman and uh, he's the hardcore closer. So I had a character called the hardcore opener. And so instead of close, I just go up to a house and I just start banging on the fucking door. I'm like, I'm about to buy your house. And I just walk in, you know, and so it's just taking what's already there and finding the opposition to whatever that is. Um, that's really where that stuff came from. But you know, what I wanted to answer is you asked, but, you know, it's either like this super intense thing or it's like this funny, ridiculous stuff. And that's really, it's sort of the same thing as the working for the government and for myself. It's this duality of just my personality in general. And I call it sort of the 95-5 principle, which is not something that I intentionally did. It's just something I noticed about myself, which is 95% of the time, I'm one of the most laid back, chill people you're going to meet, uh, just joke around and 
mess around. And then there's 5% where if you see me play a sport or compete, uh, or if I decide to talk about an intense thing on the stage, I'm like the most competitive person you've ever seen, like to the point where it's detrimental to people's happiness around me at times. Like, so it's really that there's these two edges. And so even in my book, there'll be funny sections. And then the next chapter might, might literally be like something that will make you cry. <clears throat> and so to me, it's I'm the same person. It's just there are different sides. And the more extreme people experience you, the more they tend to either build a bond or hate you. So I'm sure there's plenty of people who hate me. I'm sure there are, but uh, you can't avoid the haters sometimes. No, so it's, it's impossible. The the last thing I think, because we're running out of time here, uh, you, one of the things you're known for best is kind of uh, popularizing marketing tactics. So the uh, subject line, changing the name of the from in the subject line is something oh, that maybe, I, yeah. I first saw from you that really took off. Uh, right now, I'm seeing a lot of these Google Doc sales pages, and I think that That's you, if you you either invented or popularized it. But uh, so, how do you approach when you when you find one of these ideas or think of them? How do you start testing it? Because uh, you know, when you eventually sell a course on it, you've done a million dollars in sales on that technique before you right. you start promoting it. So, how do you think about finding ideas and testing them? That's a really good question, um, and it's really important to me that it has made a legitimate amount of money before I teach it because so many people just teach an idea because it's cool. Uh, the from names, I had started doing them for myself, I think, or it might've been the first thing was actually, it was for Paleo Secret when they were called that. Um, I wrote an email from your abs and the subject line was, you know, do this to me right after you wake up. And I wrote them as though I was the abs. And we got five times more sales from that email than any other email in the sequence. So, and okay, I'm on to something here. So I started doing it for my list and it'd be like from your wallet, you know, subject line, I'm empty inside, um, stuff like that. Just writing as the wallet and just a bunch of ridiculous stuff. And then one that I do that it's, it's really convenient. My name's Ian is that I'll send one from like Brazilian Stanley. It's a story about when I was in Brazil or embarrassing or things like that um because my name happens to fit in a lot of stuff with henry it's not as easy yeah, it's not going to slide in there um but i'll do that but basically you know i tested that and i was like holy shit this is really working and then i actually went to this mastermind with a bunch of it was like seven eight figure business owners and i was going to present on from names and i was like i don't know if i really want to do this everybody's going to start doing it and fran wrangle who i think you probably know goes <coughs> he's like don't worry, bro. Nobody ever does anything. They won't do it. And I go, okay. And he was right for about six months. And then Tyler Bramlett and Joel Marion started doing it. And Biotrust's like whole business now is largely that. And so literally billions of dollars worth of health products have been sold because of from names. I've seen none of that money. Um, I made the mistake of teaching that one for free. And then the Google Docs stuff, I can't remember why I created the first one. I just had this idea. I was partly lazy, but I just like, what if I just write this in a Google doc? And the funny thing is I don't even use Google docs for my own normal writing. I use text edit, but I was like, Oh, this is interesting. And, and then I figured out I could put gifts into it and make it like more entertaining and fun to read. And so that first sales page we did on Facebook, we normally just tried to break even on cold traffic and we ended up, uh, getting a $30 CPA on a $150 AOB. So we have 5X ROAS on Facebook, day zero on a writing challenge. So I was like, oh, this is working. So from there, I just started using Google Docs sales pages because they were easier, they were more fun, they were unique. And then I created the course partially because I told my business partner, I'm like, I don't want to really make a course about this. I don't want everybody to do this. He's like, well, if you don't do it, somebody will because we have people who steal my shit and then go and teach it as their own. Um, and so he was like, either we teach it or somebody else will. And I was like, okay, I'll teach it because I actually know what I'm talking about. So that course has done really well. Uh, and that's funny, I haven't seen that many yet, but I haven't been, I don't consume much anymore. Uh, but I think the Google Doc sales pages are gonna have a little a little run here. Yeah, and they, I've, they work. I've seen it from, uh... My friend Roy Fur, who was just on the podcast last week. Yeah, he was he promoted it for me. Yeah, he did yep. it. I, I think Marcella did one. I saw a couple other people. They just hit my oh, inbox cool. and I'm like, oh yeah, this is for me. And it's another yeah. one of those Ian things going around. Well, yeah, and it's uh 
Did you I, you do remind me of Sean? It's your inflection is like his, but also you ask really good questions. Like nobody's asked me most of the questions that you've asked me on here. Um, but to me, it's like at this point, if we're going to create a product, because I used to create a product like every month. And that was kind of the business model. And it works every time I create a product, the list buys like crazy. But it's not really that's not really long term growth of like, let's build a $20 million company by me just releasing a new product all the time. So now if I do it, I want it to be something that's like, okay, that's a bit, that's a game changer. Like that's going to change the way people do things in the future. And I've had a few, I've been lucky enough to have a few of those ideas that have changed stuff for people. And so uh, I think for this year, maybe that's it. Maybe that's all I got is the Google doc, but uh, it's yeah, only one, Docs, only one universe thing. changing idea a year for you. That's it. That's all I can manage. I hey man, I know you have a hard out. I, I've had a lot of fun on this. Uh, where can people, fun, where can people go to find you? Yeah. So you can go to, uh, at becoming Ian Stanley on Instagram. I post my stand up there and other things. Uh, although I've not had Instagram on my phone for four days and it's been glorious. Um, but that's one place. If you want to get on the email list, you can either go to uh, persuasionhitman.com. That's where my book is and you can get my book and you'll get on the email list that way. I write daily emails. Email is kind of what I'm known for. Uh, you can also just go to feedthewolf.com and there's an opt-in page on a very ugly website there that you can put your email in and, and get our, get the emails as well. All right. I'll, I'll include those links in the description. Oh, actually, Also, whenever this comes out, hopefully it'll be ready. The money. D so if you go to moneydnaquiz.com, I have a quiz. It's like 27 questions about your childhood, things you learned in your growing up and how that relates to money. And it'll give you which money block you most struggle with. So since we talked about that today, that's probably a good place for you to go. And what was that URL again? Just moneydnaquiz.com. All right. We'll include that too. Ian, thanks for coming awesome. on. Thanks, dude. That was very fun.